Welcome to the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers. My name is Jackson Mummy, and each week we'll be bringing you updated information about the bar exam and what you need to do in order to make the next bar exam your last bar exam. Ready to get started? Let's jump to it. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Today is Wednesday, October 11th. Did you guys notice that this Friday is October the 13th? We have a Friday the 13th in October. Seems weird. If I were the New York bar examiners, I'd release results on Friday the 13th, I think. What do you think? You remember that bar, don't you think? Yeah, 13th? that would be it. Yeah, Friday the 13th will be like, good luck. We'll turn the bad luck day into a good luck day. Yeah, they, they just, oh man. I thought they were going to release New York results already. My spidey sense has failed me. So they're late in the game, I think, here to be in October 11th without New York results. But we're glad to have all of you here live. And those of you that are watching or listening later on the replay or in the podcast, good to be with you. Today, Tracy's here and Brianna's here and Amanda's here. And Bobka has joined us today and we're glad to have him. Although I just, he just left his chair, so I don't know where he went. There he is, he's back. It's good to see you. We're glad to have you with us today, as always. June is traveling. She is not with us today and we will miss her, but uh, she will be back next week. We're glad to have everybody here. We're going to give you some update on results. We're going to talk a little bit about some things coming up, and then we've got some questions. I was trying to think of a good way to describe today, but what I really wanted to call it was like Misconception Monday, but it's a Wednesday. Because there were a lot of questions that came out this week that just had these weird premisei, premises to them that they were just like, no, that's not really true. And then people go off on a tangent because they've got this weird but foundational element. So I thought we would uh, debunk some myths today. And if anybody can think of a good way to title that, that is an alliteration with a Wednesday, I'm all for it. So there you go. Next thing I want to talk about is boot camp. There is still space remaining. Boot camp is November 3rd and 4th here in Denver. We're going to be talking about photo reading and mind mapping. Tracy is going to be doing small group work on essay writing. Amanda's going to be doing small group work on MBE, or actually multiple choice, and MPT. Uh, June's going to be doing mindset coaching. Brianna is doing pre-boot time management coaching. So we got a lot of people involved here, and uh, we're pretty excited about how this is, is going. I know, Brianna, you've talked to some folks already to get them ready for time management before boot camp, right? I have. And they have been eye openers for some of these students who think that they can wait to start until boot camp starts. And I'm like, nope, come on, get with the program. This is every hour or every week that you wait adds another hour of like total overall study time that you've got to put in. So start today. If you're thinking about moving, jump in because the sooner I can get you on a schedule to get you, make sure you're done with your studies by the time the exam gets here, the better. Yeah, I think it's a real benefit. If you are purchasing that workshop by itself, it's a $200 workshop with Brianna. So that's included in your boot camp. If you're doing either one of Amanda's workshops, those are $4 each. Amanda, that's exciting that you get to teach this live to small groups, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to be great. And it's a great deal for everyone. And again, like Brianna said, like, can't wait. You get to get ahead and you get to start off on the right foot. So all of your practice post boot camp is going to be well informed by all this information that you're going to get at boot camp for a really great deal. Yeah, we're, we're really looking forward to it. And Tracy, this will be your second boot camp teaching. It's really a great experience, isn't it, to be live with people and, and working with them one on three, one on four, one on five, something like that. Yeah, it's actually unmatched in anything else that we can provide because there's nothing like that uh, same room energy and ability to immediately respond to your work product and for you to share and see what other people are doing and learning from their growing edges as well as things they're doing superbly well. And there isn't any other thing, even though we offer lots of opportunities, boot camp is its own animal and it is a great opportunity for you. Yeah. The way that this process works is that there's an application that you have to fill out and a hundred dollar application fee that's refundable. If you are accepted into boot camp, then we apply the hundred dollars to your tuition. And the way that you can find all of this is to go to the website celebrationbarreview.com, then go to the resources and you'll see the boot camp link. Just click on that and that'll give you all the details and the link to fill out the application. 
And if you're selected, you get a golden ticket and you get a coffee mug and all kinds of other good swag. The other thing I just want to let you know is that, that your photo reading course is included in Boot. If you've already purchased photo reading, we're going to give you a credit for that. So we want to make this as manageable as possible for you. One of the questions that we did get this week, someone said, how many installments can I have to pay my remaining balance to boot camp? The answer is there's an eight payment plan, eight monthly payments. And uh, you can do that. It's a little bit more expensive than just paying all in full. Or you can pay the discounted price with four equal monthly payments using Klarna or Afterpay. And you'll see that option when you go to, to check out. So lots of different ways to pay for this. And of course, a variety of hotel prices and uh, airfare prices. And as results are coming out, and we still are missing results in a lot of big jurisdictions, if you're getting your results and they're not favorable, I really encourage you to come to boot camp. I think it makes a, a big difference there. I'd also have been getting questions from people that were not registered with Celebration Bar Review whether or not they could attend boot camp. The answer is yes, if space is available. So we hold our spaces primarily for our registered students, but we expect that there will be space if you're not in our course and you want to come to boot camp, you could do that. I didn't talk about June's mindset coaching. That's another $400 value and you get to work with our fairy godmother and certified mindset coach. And man, that's awesome stuff. I love it when she starts revving up with the group. There's a lot of good stuff there. It's funny on the panel, I'm, I'm looking at Brianna and Amanda and Bobka. And of course they all came in during COVID when we couldn't do boot camp, but we're going to get Amanda to this one and hopefully we'll get Bobka and, and Brianna in, in upcoming boot camp events, but yeah, fun. Let's talk about results. This has been a relatively quiet week for results. I'll just tell you the jurisdictions that are reported since we were last together. And uh, we have some information, but not a lot. Delaware reported in and uh, small jurisdiction, as you would expect. They only give these names once a year. They're weird. But in any event, uh, 262 bar takers, 53% repeat pass rate and a 64% first time pay taker bar rate. That's really unusual. The first time rate is really low. And the repeat rate is really high. I have no idea what's going on there, except that maybe most of their takers are repeaters because they don't offer a February test. Go figure. That's Delaware. The next state I wanted to just let you know about is Nevada. Nevada, also a very small jurisdiction, less than 300 bar takers. Their numbers, 63% first-time taker rate, so again, pretty low, and 36% repeater rate. That 30% rate in the 30th percentile seems to be where most jurisdictions are falling for repeaters. New York has not come up, has not released results. So we're like, come on, New York, come through. Pennsylvania, big jurisdiction, about 1,400 bar takers. And here we've got a 33% repeater rate and a 71% first time rate. This would be the state that I think is most typical. And this is what we're seeing kind of matches up to Florida, I think, in terms of, of where the, the results were. Tennessee, again, a pretty good sized state, 700 bar takers, 28% repeater rate, 67% first time rate. Texas results came out, but we haven't seen any reported official results. And we don't want to report results and numbers until we see the official numbers, but Texas is now out. And then Massachusetts released yesterday, and we do not have the official numbers on Massachusetts but we know that those results are out. Amanda, I'm going to jump to you here. I know you're very much involved in the Massachusetts bar, and, and certainly you've been watching results around the country. Any hot takes here about the, the numbers that we're seeing? Certainly. I think, again, numbers for repeat takers are still low. There's a lot of just anecdotally repeat takers I know in Massachusetts that were not successful on this exam, didn't get that passing score. And Certainly, repeat takers are at a disadvantage, and we definitely try to cater to that. We've talked about how doing the same thing over and over again certainly isn't going to help, and a lot of repeat takers do need to change it up and use some of the skills that we teach here at Celebration to help them get over the line. So yeah, I'll be curious to see Massachusetts. In fact, we're just having a conversation at the firm, um, my partner and I, um, and she was just saying, I'm looking at the repeat percentages from the last couple of years. And she was lamenting about how they are not looking great. Yeah. yeah. 
They're not. And I think and we're going to talk about some of the misconceptions about that in a minute. But I think when we look at these bigger jurisdictions where we've got enough of a sample size, if we're getting 30% on repeat bar taker pass rates, that's pretty good relative to where the, the general population is. I think it's easy to be a little bit misled in these small jurisdictions that have slightly higher pass rates. It's just a small sample size and it's really tough to know. Brianna, what's your thought? You're in Texas. Uh, Amanda's up in Massachusetts. So you got some feedback because the Texas results came out again. We don't have the actual numbers, but anecdotally, what are you hearing in Texas? Yeah, it's like you said, it's the same thing I've been seeing across the board. Trying to divide this whole thing between repeat takers and first time takers and where we pass the bar, all of this, and it's just numbers. One of the things that I I told myself when I was going through as a repeat taker was, generally speaking, I've got a one in four shot of getting that passing score. And if I want to be that one in four statistic or be a part of that one in four statistic, I'm going to have to do the things that everybody else isn't willing to do. I'm going to have to be better than three other people on that statistical standard. And just, I'm going to have to work hard. I'm going to have to dig in. I'm going to have to sacrifice more. You're going to have to do whatever it takes to be able to to, to make yourself one of those numbers. Yeah, you're just in that vote with a repeat taker. Yeah. Bobka, I know that you did things differently as a repeat taker and you switched jurisdictions and you made some fairly significant changes. I think you would echo what Brianna's saying right, about how to approach that. Oh, totally. Because if something doesn't work, you have to revamp the wheel. It's not doing the same thing over and over again, hoping for a different result. And when I switched from California to Georgia, that was the kicker for me. And then at the same time, you sprinkle celebration by review on it with all the materials that I got. I think that was the key to my success. So I would say the numbers are what they are, but we can equally turn that narrative to be what you want it in your favor. It's all about doing the work and being consistent about it, doing the work consistency and being intentional too, because you can be committed on Monday and then Tuesday. Yeah, I'm not feeling it today, man. Okay. No, it's like you got to feel it every day. Even days that you have to study property, you still got to feel it because you have a choice now, of not feeling it or not going to work, but at least you have, you are an attorney. Yeah, I think that's right. At least you're an attorney. <laughs> so there you go. So I, I don't know. I don't know what I would say about that. You just decided, judge, I think I'm not going to show up today. I, I cast the bar. I just, I think I'll go golfing today. Let's try it. Let's try it and see what happens, Bob. Good for so, fun times. But look, I think if you're in that situation where you got your results this week or last week and they're not favorable, the worst thing you can do is just keep pounding and doing the same thing over and over again. We're going to talk about that in a minute here. But really, these numbers continue to be not great numbers. No matter what, they're just not great numbers. And you have to be better than that. You have to do more and you got to use the tools that are available. I'm always disappointed when I see a student who comes up short because I know what a frustration it is for them. But then it sometimes is equally frustrating for us on our side to say, here's the tool that could make this manageable and it could get you over the top. And the, the student says, oh no, I don't want to do that. It's like, how long do you want to live in misery here? There are solutions, but you got to be willing to get into them. We will get into that. That's what we've got in the way of results. I would expect New York to come out. I really do think Friday the 13th. I think they're weird sense of humor. And then once New York drops, typically we see New Jersey come along. DC will be later. I think that it would be not surprising to get some of those Northeastern jurisdictions as well. Once New York is out of the way. Of course, we're still in California and Georgia. There you go. Long time down the road. All right. Tracy's homily today is going to be about the iPhone 15. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. I don't know if we're going to be talking about overheating or titanium or shiny, bright, shiny objects, but I'm looking forward to all three of those discussions. So we'll get to that. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into some of the student questions that we got. And as I said at the beginning of the, the episode today, there was a common theme to all of these, which was misconceptions, people making assumptions about the test and about how to work. And so I thought today we'd talk about some of these study questions we got and some of this analysis that we're hearing from people to try and, and deal with that. I actually want to start with something that came from another bar review course, because I, I thought this was a good place to start. There are many bar reviews obviously out there, and, and some of them have a social media presence. 
And one of them that has a social media presence is doing a series of misconceptions, which is funny because I've been talking about the 10 myths of the bar exam for 25 years. But this week, one of their misconceptions was you can pass the bar exam without memorizing. And the gist of their message was you have to memorize in order to pass the exam. I'm going to give you my sense and then I'm going to turn it over to the panel as well. In my experience, memorization is by far the least effective and the most time consuming method to study for the exam. It is very difficult to get all of this material into your brain and keep it there. And I think for a lot of people, what happens is that as they put in a new piece of information, sliding it in and there's, you've got to push something else out. And so people get stuck because they can't keep it all in their brain. And so they use things like mnemonics or flashcards or other memory devices, and it just isn't very effective. And I haven't seen anyone that, that actually goes out and memorizes in the actual practice of law. I just think that's not the way people practice. They practice based on what they know, what they look up, and what they research. So I think telling bar takers they have to memorize does a disservice. So having said that, let me throw it out there. Amanda, I'm going to start with you. What's your take on memorization? Yeah, I just think that it's important to be intentional with words. So when big box bar reviews are saying the cornerstone to passing the bar exam is memorization, I don't know if they even mean what they purport to say. Although it would seem like with the case of mnemonics and those sorts of things that those are rote memorization. And I think some of the reasons that narrative is out there is because it definitely feels good and satisfying to the conscious mind to memorize. You do these flashcards and you're like, look, I know the law. That's the rule of perpetuity is those are the elements of negligence. This is the different versions of homicide and all the elements to prove it. But I think that if memorization was the number one key factor to passing the bar exam, probably a lot more people would be passing the bar exam. I think it is a lot of wasted time. People get bogged down and I need to memorize all these different elements and all these different rules when it's probably not the most effective way. Certainly, I did not go into this bar exam thinking I'm going to memorize all of this. And it just seems to be an impossible task. You're just setting yourself up for failure almost by just setting out this task that is not realistic to be able to memorize all this law. I think through application and working with the material and synthesizing the material and building on that, as you do in your mind maps, you synthesize and build on your understanding of the material, it's going to get you a lot farther into passing the bar exam. And I think at some level, you might end up, quote, memorizing things, but not in the way you do with mnemonics or other things. You will be able to recall the things, but you'll remember them, but you're not memorizing them. And that's where I think we have to be intentional. We're not telling you you're not going to remember things on the bar. You're certainly going to remember and know a lot about the law. We're just not saying that the road to get there is through rote memorization flashcards. Yeah, I, I think there's a big distinction between knowing and memorizing. Yes. I mean, you know it and you remember it. I think that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Bob, could, were you a memorizer? No. And that's because the, the sheer volume of the material doesn't allow you to memorize. And then you just bury yourself in your own misfortune. Basically, you're just digging your own grave because where are you going to memorize? Where are you going to start? Where are you going to end? And at the same time, it's it's just a lot. And I think some of these companies, they do this for clickbaiting, probably to get more traffic on their website. Meanwhile, their true intentions are not reflected because if you, if this is what you're saying, then I guess we need to see who has passed. I've taken the big box bar review four times. It didn't go. And then I did something different. Of course, that was the key. My, my perspective on that is that is just creating panic. And then it's giving people a false sense of security. You need to memorize, you need to memorize. And then all of a sudden now when somebody memorizes and then they take their program, they memorize, and then they don't pass, it's, I got to go you ransom because I did what you told me. I don't have the result. What's going on? Meanwhile, it's not about knowing the law. It's about applying the law. Yeah. The applying is so important. Definitely. Tracy, in, in your time on the bench, 
Did you have a lot of lawyers come up to you and say, I've memorized the rules and I want to quote some rules to you? They may have done it, done it once, but they didn't do it that for the first time. Here, here's the thing. If you use flashcards and I'm going to test you on what are the elements of felony murder, then you might be able to tell me the elements of felony murder. But if I put it in a narrative form, you aren't going to be able to pull it up and and relate to it. You're not going to be able to answer the question because flashcards don't work for that type of testing. You have to learn how to be relational. You have to relate the material to um, what the bar examiners are going to be asking you. Use the FLA and roll right through it. What will happen when you use your mind maps is they'll pop into your head. You're not popping into your head flashcards. Popping into your head relationships. And it's all about making relationships. When you're before me in court, I want to know the relationship I belong to the facts that are the dispute, the central dispute that you have in front of me. And then how are you applying those? How do you want me to apply those? I don't want you to stand up and show me your flashcards and talk about all the elements of felony murder. Well, I know that. That's not what I'm asking you about. So it's so important to get out of this transactional way of thinking and into relation. And it's something that's going to carry you into your law practice. This isn't just something that you're going to learn how to do it and then dump it. You're going to apply it. I'm sure Amanda and Brianna and Bakker are applying it now. And it makes them much better lawyers. Well, I wish I had this kind of training. I backed into it and figured it out on my own. But you don't have to do that. You have the training. Yeah, I think so. You talk about time management with people constantly as part of what we offer in the course. There isn't enough time to memorize, is there? Even if it was the thing to do, it would just be tough. Yeah. And, and it's like you said, your conscious brain only has so much capacity to be able to take on so much information. So when you're trying to memorize all of this content for the bar, one thing's in, one thing's out. You can't, you can't just, and then put yourself in a really high pressure situation to try to recall all of that information, you're going to forget something. It's just, you're setting yourself up for failure. You, you don't have to memorize these things. It's like Amanda said, you end up knowing it because it's familiar, because you've been applying it, because you've been doing the work, because you've been hearing it and seeing it and writing it and going through the essays and the MBEs. It becomes second nature. So. You're like one in one with the material and the law and being able to apply it, like Tracy's talking about. When your clients, like the memorizing works in law school, it doesn't work for the bar exam. Bar exam is they're wanting to know if you have the minimum competence to sit down in front of a client and tell that client why they should or shouldn't spend thousands of dollars in legal fees. So they want to know. And if a client comes and sits down in front of you, they don't want you to regurgitate the law to them. They don't care about the elements of felony murder or, or the elements of any other, of, of a tort or a negligence claim. They don't care about that. They want to know if they have a case. Can you dissect it and peel back all the layers and all the facts and find out what that one little piece is, that one little nugget that might be your shifting thing? And you can't do that based on memorization. You just can't. Yeah. You have to work through it. And, and, and to put a cap on this, the bar exam is adapting to the next generation exam in the next couple of years. And it is completely moving away from this idea of just reciting elements and memorization. I, I'm going to say what probably sounds snarky, but I, I just mean it in the context of being honest. I think when a bar review company says something like, you need to memorize in order to pass the exam, it's lazy on their part. It is literally saying, you just knock yourself out, put in five or 600 hours, because that's what it's going to take to memorize the material. And that takes the burden off of us. All we have to do is deliver material and information to you. You memorize it. You go take the exam and good luck. And I think that does an enormous disservice, particularly to the repeater market. So yeah, I wanted to call out that particular bit of nonsense. I know it's commonly held wisdom and look, it's true. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, so anyway, that that's where we are. Memorization. If you want to memorize, this is not the course to take because we really don't want you to memorize. We don't think it's useful or helpful to you. We think knowing the law is much better and there's ways to learn the law. So 
Thank you, panel. I appreciate all of that. Mm. Let's turn just slightly here. Got a, a message this week from a student that has taken the bar exam before they came to us a few times. And this was in Florida. And they said, I, I was trying to find parallels between my past three exams to show where I could improve, but I couldn't find any. It was frustrating to see I did well in one subject, then completely bombed that same subject on the next exam. Why is there so much up and down from exam to exam? And this, of course, affects my studying. It becomes stressful. It, it seems like I always do well enough on five of the six subjects and then end up failing the entire subject exam because of the one subject I bombed. All right. Now, th there's a lot to unpack here. Let me start by saying it is virtually impossible to do a measurement from one exam to the next exam to the next. That is, each exam stands separately, and so it's very difficult. And so when someone says, I was good in one subject, let's say torts, on this exam a, a couple years ago, and then I didn't do well on torts this time, torts is a big subject, and there's a lot in torts, and it may well have been that in the essay question that was asked, you applied the principles and you talked about the conflicts and disputes, but on another torts question, you weren't as comfortable and you started trying to recite elements or you got bogged down and lost the, the focus of the question. So you can't really compare them subject to subject. Maybe you can look at your MBE score subject to subject, but even there, the questions vary enough that it's hard to have a vertical comparison. So that's the first thing that I would say about this. The second thing in terms of why is there so much up and down from exam to exam? We're going to get into this a little bit deeper in another question that we've got. But one of the things you have to understand is how your jurisdiction grades. And so in Florida, they grade you against the mean raw. And if you're above the mean raw, you get scale points. If you're below the mean raw, you lose scale points. And so it's not just your performance. It's your performance relative to the overall test takers in the world, particularly if you're in a jurisdiction like Florida. And I think it's something to keep in mind. The last thing I want to say, and then I'll turn it over to the panel, is that this student said, always trying to cram the subjects instead of concentrating my focus. Yeah, cramming just doesn't work very well. You really have to learn and know the material. And then instead of panicking and freaking out, trying to hit home runs, and then you strike out on that sixth subject, you write consistently, you make contact, thinking about baseball in honor of Tracy. And the idea here is make contact. That's what the FLA writing system does. It allows you to stay in the center of the, the problem and then make arguments and make up the law if you have to, but you're going to be roughly in the area. What happens though, is that if you rely on memorization and issue spotting and recitation, if you don't know it, you don't know it. And the, the subject matter is just too broad to get it all. To, I, I think one of you said, you just cannot, it's too voluminous. You can't know it all that way. So those are the things that I see in that question. Let me throw it out to you, Brianna. What's your take when you hear that particular concern? I can understand and appreciate what the student is trying to do. They're looking at their overall scores on their past tests, and they want to know the areas that they can focus on to try to improve their scores. I get it. But what you need to understand is that you're not necessarily going to be tested on those same subjects on the next exam. Like Jackson was saying, every single test is going to be different. So while you see one little area that you could probably improve upon, I guarantee you could make improvements across the board. Okay. So trying to narrow that focus right now isn't necessary. I recommend that if you're at this stage and you're flailing and you're finding yourself cramming and going back and forth and back and forth, just start over. Start from the beginning, go through the syllabus, go through the material, dig in a little bit deeper. You got the feedback you need right now. You know right now you're not where you need to be. You know you have to work a little harder. You know you need to familiarize yourself with the material a little bit more. So just do it across the board. Yeah, good advice. Popka, what's your thought? I would say the student is in the right place, first of all. Coming from where he's coming from to CBR, he's in the right place. Second of all, I would say to add, to add to Brianna's point, you cannot take an, let's say you, you um, take February to compare with uh, July. Those are two different exams and we don't know what the bar examiners factor into how they grade. So that's the uncertainty of that. However, there is something that this, this student can do and 
our program is not geared at memorization. It's geared at knowing the law. And to Brianna's point, get into the nitty gritty, get your hands dirty. You have to do the work. And part of doing the work, starting over. Page one of one, go through the Holy Grail with a study guide. And when you finish, it's not going to be memorization. You're just going to know stuff. And that's going to be, because if you bog down yourself in trying to memorize or you're trying to, you're trying to use a previous formula on a new formula. No, it's not going to work. You're going to freak yourself out and then it's just going to be chaos. So avoid that, stick with the program and it should be okay. Yeah, avoiding chaos is good. Amanda, we didn't, we didn't hear from you. Glenn. No, I think the things that Brianna and Bobka have already brought up, I totally agree with not getting bogged down to two in that. And it also just goes to point out that there is a little bit of luck in what we score in the bar exam, just in what topics are given. I remember when I first took New York, I could not have gotten any more lucky because the major essay was free speech. This was when the exam looked very different. It was the New York bar and it was, it's literally my expertise. I could write on free speech and it was not only free speech, it was free speech in schools. But I was just like, I don't know what I scored on it, but I'm sure it's just luck. Like you said, you might get something that really throws mm -hmm. you too. Even if you really know a subject, it messes you up. And then when you're talking about passing by one or two points, to Brianna's point, is you could also just improve across the board so that when you get a question like that, it might just be luck and whatever is on the exam because you've improved overall and you can be more level mm -hmm. throughout the whole thing. So it's very hard to compare. Yeah, you don't have to hit home runs on all the essays. You just don't want to strike out. I think that's the point. I literally saw a score sheet from somebody the other day. They had an 80 out of 100 points on one essay and a zero, an actual zero on another essay. It just, it doesn't translate to 240s. You got to be in the game all the way through. And I think that's part of it. Tracy, any thoughts that you got as you, you heard that question? Yeah, I just uh, noted all the inconsistencies in the question itself. Whoever wrote that question, go back and read your question. And then I agree, just start over. It's not about memorizing. It's about applying. You have to apply what you learn in law school. You have to apply what you learn in our program when you go into that exam. Amanda got lucky on her exam. On my exam, there was a question about contracts, but it had high tides and low tides as part of the question. I live in Landlock, Colorado. I have no idea the difference between a high tide and a low tide. But And I immediately froze. I just still remember this 40 so long years later. I froze and I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? And then I just worked around the problem and did something else. So if you're confident going in, you can work around those problems. If you're relying on your note cards, it's not going to work. Absolutely. And I'll just say, I, I understand the frustration that the student feels. And part of the reason they feel it, we got another comment from somebody that wasn't in our course, actually. And I wanted to talk about that because I think that there's clearly a problem that people get into and they read and hear and listen to stuff like this. So let me give you this comment that somebody wrote that was not one of our students. And I want to break it down and I'll give it to the panel. So this person starts out and says, it might be the same exam, but the experimental questions used on the MBE are different. And the average of these is different between February and July tests. The mean applied and average points up or down is different than July. Let me start with that. The experimental questions don't count for anything. So who cares? Literally, who cares? Really? This is what this person thinks moves the needle? Experimental are evaluation questions. There's 25 of those on every exam. That has no impact on the scale whatsoever. They take those 25 and they throw them out. So this person starts with a misunderstanding of how the score are done. Second thing is the difference in the mean raw between July and February exams is a fraction of a point. Fraction of a point, not even three, four, five points. It's a fraction. It's less than one point. And so that is not what is making it. Then this individual goes on to say, I took both the July and February tests, so apparently they failed somewhere. And they said, oh, it was much more difficult in February. My A score was 168, but in February it was 128 because of the scaling applied. That's nonsense. That has nothing to do with the scaling. I suspect that this person is looking at numbers that are not accurate in terms of understanding raw and scale, but you don't get a 40-point drop because of the exam. You just don't. 
And in our course, we never see that. I have no idea what they're talking about. It's certainly not because of the scaling. Then they go on to say, and they might be true here, the NCBA uses the multi-state as a means of limiting the professional numbers and restricting failures, but they love the July applicants and that's who they want to be in the profession. And they don't like people in February. What? Really? That's the kind of stuff that's out there. And watching your faces as you're hearing that. Brianna, what do you think? I wish I, this is a public podcast. Yeah. This is a perfect example of getting completely lost in the weed. The fact that this person is trying to make sense of all this is silly. If you want to be an attorney and you want to pass the bar exam, you're just going to have to put in the work. Let go of some of this other stuff. This is just noise, distraction. I'm baffled. Yeah, exactly. So Amanda, 40 point difference on the MBE. The February exam is harder. Do you agree? Yeah, I don't know what happened with the 40 point difference. I couldn't say for sure of why there could be so many reasons why. And I think this myth probably comes from the idea that the pass rate is, quote, the overall pass rate is higher in July, but there are many reasons for that. I think that's probably like where the root of this myth started, that the July exam is easier and easier could mean a lot of things, like easier to predict, like it could mean a lot. So there are a lot of reasons why February has lower scores overall, because there are people who took a break, people who took time off from school that have other things working against them, attorneys trying to change jurisdictions, people who took an extra semester to graduate, and of course, more repeat takers. And yeah, the numbers are stacked against repeat takers. And that's because repeat takers take a big box bar review or go at it in whatever way and then do the same thing again when they go to take February, which is a mistake. They just think if I study harder this time or I try again, it will work. But that's Einstein's definition of insanity. And that's why I say that they're at a disadvantage. But I do think that this, I also think the myth, this is like a long time ago, Jackson, this is you and Tracy, when you could take the two separately. You could sit for the multiple choice and then the written. Like I know like attorneys who had did that. That legacy has also trickled down, I think, like where you take the written first and then the MEE later. And, and so, oh, because that's easier, the February one, but it's not, that's not, we're not the same test anymore. But I still think there's that legacy of that floating around out there, especially if you've been talking to older attorneys. But I think I've taken both too. I've taken July and February. And it's just, it's colder in February and it's easier to park. There's not this grand difference of the exam itself at all, I don't think. I think, yeah, I think if we're going to say the bar examiners, quote, don't like the February takers, or I would say, yes, there are systematic things at issue here for repeat takers, whether that be race, socioeconomic status, ability are the more they're overrepresented in those who do not pass on the first time. But it doesn't have to do with the makeup of the exam or how the exam is graded. That's what I would say. Yeah, and this idea that there's a preference to the July bar takers over the February bar takers is just utter nonsense. Doesn't yeah. There's not a preference because of the month they're taking it in. There's a preference yeah. because <laughs> those people graduated on time. They went through yeah. traditional schooling. And they have a socioeconomic advantage, potentially. So there is a statistical... Well, they have an advantage taking the exam, but the examiners don't care. Exactly. The examiners don't that. care about July or February or that. We right. see this play out. And I think that's what we're seeing here. Yeah. So this, Yeah, no, yeah. I think what we're seeing here is anxiety. When I look at this question and look at it carefully, it's a person who's in denial about what has possibly happened in yeah. their life. And they're grasping it. What could it possibly be? I don't see anything in here about their own study habits, their own, what they've been doing to try to change anything. It's all about external factors. Be clear, it. this is not one of our students. This is somebody that responded okay. on social media. And I, I'm, I'm using this as an example because I get a lot of comments on social media. But this one just stood out to me as being 
the penultimate of understanding, bad facts, bad reasoning, bad thought process. And then they get stuck. Can I just say from experience, I was a first time taker in February. And then I took second time July and I failed both of those exams equally bad. Then the third one in February, three times, February, July, and February, okay? Took seven years off. Came back again and took February and passed with flying colors. I, me, myself, and I is the sole reason I passed in February. You so, wasn't the four yeah. examiners liked you better? Okay, so the, there we go. Static because they yeah, didn't like you. Bob, can you took the February and July exams? Could you tell if we put them in front of you and said which ones for February and which ones for July? Could you distinguish them? No, because either way, I'll just take them to pass. And I think this person is focusing their energy on the wrong thing. Whatever the bar examiners are going to do, they're going to do it. Your energy should be more focused on, I need to cover my materials. This is what I need to do to, to study to pass. That's it. Because whether you figure it out or not, the bar examiners don't care whether you take the bar in February or July. They don't. All they know is, hey, we're going to have applicants in February. We're going to have applicants in July. Whether they take the exam or not, that is your cup of tea. But if you're seeking a mission, you're going to have to do the hard work. And focusing all this energy on the permutations and whether the examiners like to, to Amanda's point, February is cold. I don't like it. I don't like the cold. July is much more <laughs> because it's the summer. You can dress any kind of way and then you go and then you're feeling good. The examiners don't even care. They don't control the weather. No, they control the administration of the exam. Putting your energy in this versus putting your energy in the study seems counterintuitive to me. Yeah. It's the wisdom of the crowd. It's the urban myths and all the stuff that's out there. And silly me, I've only done this for 30 years. So what do I know? I want to get to one other misconception before we turn to Tracy's message today. And we're just going to hit it quickly. This is a student that's in our course. It's a voter reader. And they said, I feel like I don't learn new things when I watch the lectures or take notes, which is unfortunate. I think it'd be more beneficial to spend all of my time doing the photo reading and then do 25 multiple choice questions a day, one essay per day. And if I do that from now until the exam, that's 100 essays and 3,000 multiple choice questions. What do you think? I think that's not a good plan. I think that is a waste of time. Brianna, let me throw that out to you. Somebody says that to you in a time management coaching call. What's your thought? I, I don't advise it. I don't recommend it. Maybe the theory behind it get through more questions, but then you're not taking that step back and you're not photo reading and exposing to the material and then listening to the material and activating the material and then doing the questions. There's a whole process behind the course and the way that it's designed. So I don't encourage this. I think it's going to be a huge waste of time. You need to go back and you need to listen to those lectures, even if it's at a faster pace because you want to get to those questions. I get it. But still go through the whole process because it's set up that way for a reason. Okay. And Tracy, should you do it on an iPhone 15? Here's the thing. If you're <laughs> like me and you were uh, raised in the dinosaur age, you learned how to do things pen to paper. When I went to the law library to find uh, resources, I went to the card catalog. Was For those of you who don't know what that is, it was a big, tall shelf with lots of shelves within the shelves and they were alphabetical and then you would look up your topic or your case and pull out a card which would send you to the stacks in the library and you would actually pull out a book and look to see what you were what you were looking for i was dragged into the technology age kicking and screaming when covid hit especially i remember march 15th 2020 and no longer could I go into a courtroom and handle my docket or handle a case. I had to learn this thing called Zoom. I didn't know what Zoom was except for just very basics. I could get on, but I didn't know anything about it. But like many of you, I was forced into learning that technology quickly. Or what would happen? The world would pass me by. I am getting an iPhone 15 today. And I've had an iPhone 12, which is, okay, good. I can use it pretty well. But I was thinking about the parallels between getting this new phone and what you all are trying to do here in learning um, this new process of how to be a lawyer. 
and how to apply law, how to find the salient facts of a dispute and state those articulately, how to state the positions that the law is leading you to, and then how to apply that. I am going to have to take a class on how to use an iPhone 15. I don't know this stuff intrinsically. Do you know this intrinsically? Were you born knowing the rule against perpetuity? Of course not. But the way you learned was the way of the dinosaur. You learn by making flashcards. You learn by making long outlines. You learn by writing everything down and memorizing it. You learned in the age of the dinosaur. You live in the age of the iPhone 15. So get with the program, get with the process, open up your materials and learn in this new, fascinating and exhilarating way. Because when you do, it's going to make you a better lawyer. From the very first day you come into court and say, you're going to be much better off. I'll take a test on iPhone 15 after I watch the video and you go ahead and do your studies the way that we have suggested you do them because you cannot afford to live in the land of the dinosaurs any longer. Thanks. And I would say the analogy here is photo reading, mind mapping, these tools that we bring, they are high tech tools and they make a difference, but you got to be able to use them and you got to trust them. You got to trust that it's really going to work. I think that's real wisdom. I want to thank our, our panelists as always, Tracy, Brianna, Amanda, Bobka. It's great to have you guys here. It's great to have you spreading some wisdom. Hopefully we, we killed a few of those misconceptions that are rolling around out there. Listen, just think about this stuff. There's a lot of people out there spouting a lot of nonsense, really a lot of nonsense about the bar exam. And frankly, they're, they're folks that just don't have much uh, basis or expertise. Be careful about where you get your information from and, and really think about it and, and analyze it. But ultimately what you heard here today is not only truth, but it's also based on experience and, and working with lots of people over lots of years. And so we stand ready to help you, whether you're in our course or you haven't come to us yet, check us out. There's certainly the opportunity to get ready for the February exam. And I'll just leave you with this. There's no difference in our student pass rate between February and July. It's virtually indis indistinguishable. So don't let that freak you out. Don't be pushed away from the February test because of some silly nonsense. Since we're talking about superstition and nonsense, have a wonderful Friday the 13th. Hopefully we will get bar results in some additional states like New York before the weekend. And we will be back with that information next Wednesday. And uh, thank you to all of you who are with us today live and uh, watching. And uh, if you're here on the podcast later, again, we appreciate you being with us. Take care, everybody. Have a great study week. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye, everybody.